Hello and welcome to Energy Bridge Africa, the link to powering the continent with myself, Ifi Peters. Now, last week, we were joined by the chair of the Central Energy Fund, a key partner for South Africa's newly established National Petroleum Company. Uh, in this episode, we're turning our focus to Africa's energy landscape and the role that the SANPC can play in addressing one of the biggest challenges uh, shaping Africa's future right now, and that's energy access. Presently, over 600 million people across the continent still live without electricity. At the same time, Africa faces mounting pressure to go green, despite contributing less than 4% of global emissions. So how do we bridge this energy gap without sacrificing growth? And how do we light up homes and industries while navigating climate and capital constraints? Uh, joining me to shed light on Africa's energy landscape is NJ Ayuk, Executive Chairman of the African Energy Chamber, and it is always a pleasure to cap catch up with you, NJ. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. And I've been knowing you for a long time, <laughs> a long time. And I want to uh, contextualize why I am uh, using that as an opening question, because for the time that I've been knowing you, we have been talking about the uh, fact that so many Africans on the continent don't have access to reliable power. 600 million is the uh, quote that we have been using for a long time. And so I'd just like to know in your view, are we moving the dial on energy poverty? No, we're not, um, Fifi, and I tell you, and I tell you why. I think our numbers have even gone above six hundred million because wow. there's some people, there's a lot of people that are not being counted. So those numbers are even higher. But even those with electricity do not actually have full access to electricity because there was a time in South Africa where you had eight to ten hours a day of load shedding. But across Africa, a lot of communities, for example, in Burkina Faso, they have electricity just four hours a day. In Mali, just six hours a day. Mm -hmm. The entire country gets electricity just six hours a day. In places like Nigeria, it's rife with blackouts and all of that. So just contextualize this. Norway, as a country, uses more electricity than Nigeria, Cameroon, the DRC, and Namibia combined. So. Our energy poverty issues are really, really, um, it's, forgive me for saying this, we're living in a mess with it. Sure. And we need to really, really improve, improve, improve that. But we stuck on those 600 million, it is actually more. So, so, so very worrying stuff. And I mean, we also know that in uh, events of uh, adverse climate conditions, uh, such as droughts or adverse floods, uh, the power situation comes, becomes even worse. We saw what happened in the recent drought and what happened with Zambia and mm -hmm. the limitations to power that ensued. My question then is that things haven't gotten better. In fact, you're making the argument that they've gotten worse. Why? And what should be the point of departure in increasing energy access and bringing those numbers down? I think we've seen a growing um, population, but the other issue that we have to really have to think is that we've invested very less when it comes to energy infrastructure and also into energy power generation. African power utilities are not performing well. We have to be very, very honest about that. Out of the entire continent, only two utilities are, are, are being are profitable right now, and that's Seychelles and in Morocco. Of the other 54, they just not be um, function as well. So you, they can't offtake gas, they can't offtake um, renewables, and they can't drive solar. But also, we have to also look at the regulatory environment where that we're in. We need to start doing the unbundling of uh, some of the national um, um, power companies, but also create a way that free markets where it's market driven, where you get more individual participants and people will take big bets and risks and they go out there and drive up power for communities that they need. It can be government being everything for everybody. And I think unless we, we break that cycle, then we're going to continue waiting for government to be your, 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 your daddy or your mommy to create power. And it's just not being worked. What role then do you see for one of the newest government-owned entities on the energy block here in South Africa in the form of the SANPC, um, what role do you envision them playing and what degree of success do you envision them having in trying to solve for this? Huge. I think this is Africa's most industrialized nation. 
You, there is a lot of wealth in the country. There is a lot of capital in the country. There's a lot of um, skill set in the country. And SNPC, while new, they'll be bringing in some of the best experts to really be able to work on upstream, midstream, downstream, um, here in South Africa and across the continent. I think we have seen the birth of an African giant that can really be able to look at projects like gas in Mozambique or just explore South Africa or like what I always say, drill baby, drill South Africa sure. and really produce every drop of hydrocarbons you can find in this country to be able to serve the South African market. Just think about this. This is the gateway to a 300 million person SADC market. You need to be producing that energy that you can sell to this entire region, whether it is gas, whether it is petroleum products, or whether it's even using the byproducts of gas, because gas is kind of like a Swiss knife. You could do, you could use it for um, LPG, you could use it for urea, ammonia, NPK, fertilizer plants, and really drive agriculture and everything. So it's not just about oil alone, it's about the multiply effect it has on the economy. So SNPC can be a huge game-changing company that really drives development in South Africa, but in the region as well. Because when you think of uh, oil uh, producing uh, countries uh, on the continent, I mean, you think about the big guys, you mm -hmm. think about, and, and, and gals, as it mm -hmm. were, you think about your Angolas, you think about Nigeria, when you think about uh, uh, where the gas is and the activity that we're seeing in that, in that landscape, you think about uh, the likes of Mozambique. I guess my question is, you don't think about South Africa right now. And uh, in fact, right, uh, where the country currently stands, we're a net importer of these resources. Your view, sort of what is the uh, appetite uh, out there on the market uh, by external players, by some of the people that you uh, interact with on a daily basis in your sector to drill baby drill in South Africa? I think there's a huge appetite to drill in South Africa. You'll be very surprised. Uh, about three, um, on Monday, Eco Atlantic just signed to become an operator in a block here in South Africa. There is, I'll give you an example. South Africa has a mentality of being, of importing and consuming and not producing oil and natural gas. And I think that's wrong. You need to look inward and really see how you drive that. And, I, I, and let's shift a little bit to the Orange Basin. Look at as much opportunities happening in Namibia. Every, they're having discoveries in the Orange Basin one after another. That's just 20% of the Orange Basin. 80% is in South Africa. So if someone has 20% someone has and, and is having so much success and Namibia is potentially going to be producing about four to 500,000 barrels of oil within in about five or seven years, imagine the, the person that holds 80% of that. If they go out there and drill, they go out there and produce, they will be doing two to three million barrels over the, in, in, the next five, in the next seven to eight years. And we also have to make it attractive. We can't act as if we're competing with Mozambique. We're competing with Guyana. We're competing with Qatar. So your fiscals have to work really well, but you have to also have a certain standard on how you treat offshore South Africa or even onshore South Africa with a lot of the environmental claims that have basically been stacked against exploration happening. Exploration for natural gas is the lifeblood of that industry. So when you look at SNPC, you're saying, get this national oil company. They might not be able to drill $90 million wells offshore, but they can work on onshore wells where you could, you, could, you could drill for less, but also attract those international companies, be it Total, Equinor, Petrobras, um, Exxon, and Chevron, to really do what they've done in Namibia or in Mozambique and do it right here in South Africa and create an environment where they can act, South Africa can actually consume that gas and that petroleum product because you can't import forever. You have to produce so you can also grow your economy locally. Yeah, it's not sustainable. I mean, a lot can happen along the way. Uh, you've got your currency that can uh, fall out of uh, significant flavor uh, or favor. You have got other supply shocks to the system that can make it a lot more uh, expensive for you to, to, to import and make your, your country a lot more vulnerable. I agree with you. But I'm also glad that you mentioned the case of Namibia and the kind of activity that we're seeing there vis-a-vis -vis what's happening in South Africa. And you spoke about uh, South Africa needing to uh, make the uh, landscape a lot more attractive. Essentially, you uh, said maybe steal, not even steal, or, or take 
from Namibia's playbook, as it mm -hmm. were. You, you highlighted the environmentalists, and I think that it would be remiss of us to not uh, um, acknowledge the pressure mm -hmm. and the accountability that some of the environmentalists are putting on these mm -hmm. oil companies to go about their business more responsibly. Yep. But outside of uh, perhaps the challenges that uh, are presented by the environmentalists, in your view, what does uh, making South Africa's uh, energy landscape attractive look like from a legislative and policy point of view? I think you already have very good regulations in South Africa. The, the fiscals are sound, they're good. There's some little changes that have to be done when it comes into government take or looking at how you, you empower black economic empowerment in the, the oil and gas sector, local content, and, but also see what the role that com com a national company like SNPC would play. So that is already working. But you have to also try to take the politicians and not get too much politics into a national oil company. That has been the problem where you've seen with Nigeria and Angola. But what did Nigeria do? Nigeria took out all the politicians on, from the board of its oil sector and everything and brought professionals in and it's making progress. And you've seen a return on uh, it, it, the market is going right back with, and betting on big dollars in the country. ExxonMobil just committed another $1.4 billion in exploration. Total and Shell just did a deal of $500 million in, in, in Nigeria. Nigeria, and so you've seen that movement is happening. So we have to be very careful with that. But also, when you look at um, South Africa, you have a company that it can really, really take off. But we need to be very careful on how political interference could be a big, big issue. I mean, you are a well-versed uh, with South Africa's story, and you would know that we've got quite a number of uh, state-owned entities that not have, have not only uh, not uh, taken off in the manner that they, they should have, or those that have, are, are looking like a problem for mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the fiscal uh, picture and mm -hmm. the, the balance sheet of mm -hmm. government right now. So, so I suppose, I mean, you did mention the private sector, and I imagine that you'll let me know, you'll tell me that the private sector does have a role to play in the success of the SA and PC. What, what does that look like uh, in your view in terms of uh, control and ownership? You mentioned board members over in Nigeria, their uh, national oil company and uh, participation of the private sector on their boards. Do you think that the same thing kind of needs to happen here in this country with this particular entity for its success? Yes, it does because, you know, it, government and private sectors have to be an enabler for SNPC to work. You need both. So you need that oversight and you need that corporate governance that's going to make it a success. But also you need to have a private sector driven mindset when it comes into acquiring assets, the right kind of partnerships with international oil companies or international service companies to help you do the necessary to produce energy for South Africans first, because that's the, that, that should be number one priority. Produce energy for South Africans first, then if you have a, an excess energy, you can export. And so you, you need everybody in the supply chain to make it work. Sometimes we've become so narrow in our thinking that we have not made that, um, we have not made that work. And I think that the private sector is going to be really key because South African entrepreneurs are going to be drivers of new projects. And those drivers should be supported by SNPC in making sure that they get their foot in the door and they get contracts and projects to make it work. NJ, we're going to have to leave it there. We are out of time, but thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Absolutely. A bit of a worrying uh, statistics just in terms of the fact that uh, perhaps even more than 600 million uh, Africans right now are uh, unable to uh, access uh, reliable and affordable energy. It just uh, speaks to the work that uh, still needs to be done in this space and uh, most certainly the uh, work and the role that uh, players existing as well as new players like the SA and PC uh, will have in ensuring that that happens. But that uh, does wrap up uh, this uh, week's episode of Energy Bridge Africa. Of course, I was in conversation with NJ, our executive chairman of the African Energy Chambers. But from myself, Fifi Peters, it is bye for now.